Good morning, everyone. My name is James Parry. I'm Chief Innovation Officer of the UK Research Integrity Office, and welcome to today's webinar on science communication and research integrity. With almost 300 people in the virtual room, I think in a few minutes after 10, it's time to get started. We do have a few more people joining us, but for those who are arriving, you haven't missed very much. There's some housekeeping announcements. So today's webinar is about science communication and research integrity. And I found a fantastic quote that I think illustrates the importance of this topic, its fundamental importance. Uh, in 1952, Professor Anne Rowe, a clinical psychologist and the first woman to be tenured in the Harvard Faculty of Education, said nothing in science has any value to society if it's not communicated. And those words still hold true over 70 years later. Communication of research is essential if our research is to have any benefit to society, and that includes not only disseminating research through journals, papers and conference proceedings, but also wider communication of research, communicating our research to the public in a way that's accessible and engaging, and that explains often complex topics in a very straightforward way. If we get communication in research right, then we not only increase understanding of our own research project, but we can potentially increase wider appreciation of the value of research. We can safeguard and enhance public trust in research, and we can inform decision making by policy makers and others, but only if we get it right. That's why this, import, this topic is so important and why I'm really pleased to have two such great speakers here today. So we'll begin with a talk from Monkeet and then we'll move on to talk from Stephen. And they're both fascinating speakers with lots of great insights to share. Uh, Monkeet is features editor and journalist with 15 years experience in science writing. He's international features editors at the British Medical Journal. Sorry, it's called the BMJ now. I keep getting that wrong. And lectures on journalism at Imperial College London and has written multiple books. Uh, Stephen is a senior lecturer in science communication at Imperial College London and also director of the Good Science Project, an ethics and research culture initiative that's run by Imperial. And before that, he was director of Imperial Science Communication Unit for over 15 years. We'll hear from both our speakers in short presentations, and then we'll move to joint uh, questions and discussion before we close off the event at 11. So I'd now like to invite our first speaker to join us. Uh, Monkeet, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, James. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Monkeet Louie, as James said. Um, and I want to start by uh, giving my perspective as a journalist and a communicator uh, for the last like 15, 20 years of working in and around science. I spent, as well as my work in journalism, I spent 12 years working for the Wellcome Trust. So I've also seen it from the sort of funders and academia side as well. And I've also previously worked for the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, who have done quite a lot of work in research culture and research integrity as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, what I wanted to do here was to uh, present a few slides as food for thought from uh, a couple of interesting reports about, uh, well, trust really. And I mean, if I if I'd start with sort of saying when we're talking, so if I flip back to here that I given the subheading of my talk is the communication of science beyond researchers, which is the, the side that I'm really looking at sort of external away from, from scientists and, uh, and academics. When you think of the audiences that you're then talking to, uh, the public is quite a wide, vague term. So then when you kind of break it down, you start to think about, OK, well, who am I actually talking to? And James mentioned policymakers, but there are obviously lots of other people, too. The public, as I say, is quite wide. They could include parents. They could include patients, different kinds of patients, different kinds of parents, people who hold the purse strings uh, for certain places, whether local councils or large government. Um, and they could, of course, include other researchers and not necessarily those within their fields. That doesn't mean they're not experts. They're just not experts in your particular part. So when you're speaking, you could be speaking to any one of these people at, at the same time. And as I said, the key thing that I think uh, matters and why research integrity and research culture matters is trust. This is something that uh, journalists rely on 
a lot, both in terms of our sources to trust us with the information so that we can then report on it, but also obviously for our readerships, for our audiences, our viewers, our listeners to trust in what it is that we're saying. Otherwise, you know, how would anyone go on any information that they get whatsoever? And I think this is where it's quite interesting. This is a slide from the uh, Reuters Institute for Journalism, which uh, does a digital news report every year. The latest one for 2024 just came out last week, actually. So this is an up-to-date slide that shows the proportion of people that they surveyed. It's quite a, a rigorous survey of 20 over 20 countries, I think. Um, and this is the proportion of people that say each is very or somewhat important to them when deciding what news outlets to trust. And as you can see here, high standards, I mean, in this case, it's journalistic standards, but you could equally swap that out for, you know, scientific standards, research standards, ethical standards, as well as transparency that rates quite highly. Um, more than uh, things like representing me or you know being similar to me or sort of anything like that and you can see that the level of negativity actually which a lot of people are quite sensitive about features quite lowly there so if i then talk about uh the welcome trust has done a survey for uh i think it's going going for nearly seven or eight years now um and it's called the welcome monitor and it tries to gauge how the british public this is just in the uk how they engage with health research in particular and uh, I'm going to look at the 2021, which is the last one that I uh, I kind of took part in communications for. And this one was uh, looking at over 2,600 people surveyed across England, Wales and Scotland. And it tried to give a snapshot of the public's appetite for engagement with health research, as well as, you know, the level of trust uh, and how engagement varies to different types of people. And there are a lot of really interesting sort of tidbits that you can pull out from the from the results of that and um, 2020 was obviously the year at that of the, the first year of the COVID pandemic so um, the results they got from that which were then reported in 2021 uh, were pretty key in terms of what how the pandemic had affected people's trust and perception of science and you can see here that actually a lot of people were interested in health related information which you might expect at that moment in time but what's notable here is that only a minority, just 28%, seem to actually seek it out, despite being interested in it generally. Younger people, those with higher education, and particularly uh, ethnic minorities were more likely to actively seek it out. But I want to draw your attention to this third point. People are interested in hearing directly from scientists, much more so than in 2015. And that's partly obviously because of the pandemic, but I think it also shows a trend that we were seeing in this and other surveys uh, throughout previous years of the trust that people hold for scientists, people that they perceive to be doing an honorable and curiosity driven profession and who would report their, their findings transparently and fairly. Um, but you can see conversely, they didn't feel the public that they that were surveyed didn't feel that scientists felt the same the other way around, just 36% felt that scientists were actually interested in the public's views themselves. Um, although most people felt that health research has had a positive impact on their life. And you can see from the, the, the bottom was that actually, you know, it's, it, it, the levels of trust and distrust then were getting a bit murky, particularly at that particular point of the pandemic. And I think it's fair to say that this has continued since, because as we know, the disparity in, in the way that the pandemic affected um, black and Asian minorities, uh, black and ethnic minorities uh, health wise, but also in the way that they were kind of treated by by the, the health of the service and the, and the government. Um, what's slightly worrying is that point at the bottom, which is the rising proportion of people that get their information from social media, particularly among younger people and particularly from, as I say, uh, BAME groups. Uh, and those facing financial difficulties, which as the cost of living crisis has become more of an issue in the recent years, is more and more of a worry. And we'll see some further results of that in a second. Uh, welcome to the follow-up survey, particularly looking at, at COVID-19 then. Um, and you can see here, I'm not gonna spend too long on this, but you can see that health, again, scientists and researchers were largely trusted as information about the coronavirus. Um, followed by government cell, uh, science advisors, but not as much so as the actual scientists themselves. And the government came quite low down, as well as their own kind of employers. Um, 
those who trusted the scientists then were more likely to see prevention measures as effective. And I think that's really key because when we think in terms of like, if we take impact of science on something like public health measures, lockdowns, masking, getting vaccinated, it really does matter that people trust scientists and what they're sort of saying. You know, leaning on that and maintaining that kind of integrity can really help to save lives and make a difference. And to quickly then move on to another survey, um, Edelman is a, a PR communications organization and they do, again, a sort of massive survey of trust uh, over, um, I think, again, over 20 countries. Uh, they look at trust in various different things, the levels of trust in various different policies, in different groups and different types of information. Um, so yeah, 28 countries, over 32,000 respondents. Uh, it's an annual survey, uh, rigorously and statistically significant. And I'm just going to run through a few graphs from this. Um, this year, they particularly picked out responses about innovation. And you can see again here, you know, who do you trust to tell you the truth about new innovation technologies? Scientists come up top alongside people just like me. I mean, yeah, you're going to trust people that are exactly the same as you come from the same background or group or friend or family or anything like that. But scientists right up there with it. And I mean, as a side note, you can see journalists and politicians coming the complete opposite downside of things, which is often sort of interesting for me. Again, trust in general, different types of people, scientists way top above teachers, surprisingly. Uh, and again, government and, and journalists uh, coming quite low down. And interesting point here about how, whether they think that scientists are able to communicate with people, just general citizens like themselves, 45%, which on the one hand is reasonably high and on the other hand, it's quite it's quite low. Um, so, you know, you can read that in, in one of two ways and you can see here on the graph how it varies from country to country. China, for obvious reasons, is has quite a high uh, level of trust in their scientists, um, whereas other countries, surprisingly, Japan and Korea has quite a low level of trust, perhaps because of the way that science is run there and the amount of science communication that is done in those countries. Um, UK comes somewhere in the middle, which is a bit disappointing considering how, how big our science communication industry is. Uh, and where do I get most of my information about new technologies, innovation, science? Online searches. We talk a lot about social media, which is up there, but actually Google is a lot of people's primary uh, source of information. And an interesting factoid, the second biggest search engine in the world is YouTube. And that again, is a big source of people's information for news or uh, information about any kind of new technology or science. And I mean, the last slide, I think, uh, are you concerned that the government has too much influence in science? Are you concerned that science has become too politicized? Yeah, that's rising. And I mean, again, unsurprising given the climate that we found ourselves in over the last few years, particularly since the pandemic. Uh, oh, there's one more, uh, nearly two times more likely to fear innovation is poorly managed. So again, do I trust how businesses and NGOs introduce innovation to society? Can the government regulate new technologies? Is science independent of politics and money? And here's again where integrity really matters. I think part of the reason why they don't trust governments and to some extent journalists is that we don't show our working. People don't know how they work. They don't know what their motivations are, but they still see for better or for worse, scientists is coming from a kind of noble view standpoint, a noble kind of profession. And that's something I think that's worth sort of maintaining. Um, and what I'm going to do now at this point is, is hand over to Stephen because he's going to now run with that and look more, much more at the, uh, the, the internal side of things. How do uh, scientists communicate with each other and with uh, the rest of academia? Mankeet, thank you so much for that. That was fascinating, a truly interesting snapshot. And I'm like you, I'm both pleased and surprised because trust is as teachers and it's disappointing. To, it's both good that 45% of the public globally think scientists can talk to people like me, but I also think like you, well, it could be worse, but it could also be a lot better. Thank you so much. Stephen, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the floor is yours. So uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Mankeet. Um, I, th I think the, the, there's only one basic thing I want to do today is um, much where I respect Monkey's work. Um, I taught him everything. Um, I want to really change the focus and look at what happens within universities. And I really want to suggest to you that science communication, this very important phrase, 
Um, it's a mistake to think it kind of begins when it's put into the hands of Munkeet, but it begins when the stuff leaves the lab. Um, you know, there's a very famous expression by Mark Walpott, head of um, Wellcome Trust at one point, and the science isn't done until it's communicated. And he implied that, you know, it's all very well um, what goes on in universities, but only when it gets into the media is it done. And I want to push against that now and really talk about what goes on um, within institutions, within universities. Um, and just to note, everything I say here today um, is as relevant to you if you're a humanities researcher, if you're an academic scientist, um, if you're um, um, an administrative officer or a research officer, all, all this is relevant to anybody who deals with um, the issue of learning in an institution. And actually, um, um, Monkey said very many valuable things, but the one I've got here, which is so interesting, he talked about um, this high level of trust in scientists. Um, and he mentioned a phrase, he used, a beautiful phrase he used was um, science as an honourable and curiosity driven um, profession. And what I'm going to do today is make the link between this idea of um, the academic, the scholar, the university worker as a person of honour. And I want to link that with um, with communication. So the, 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 the topic of the day is science communication and research integrity. And um, I'm going to be looking at communication as an internal matter. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of slightly persecutory issue of internal communications. I'm talking about how we share. Um, I'm sure you'll know that the word communication comes from um, the Latin, communicare, to share. And um, that's quite important. Monkey mentioned in his surveys, surveys that um, um, the public have defined um, is curious about science, but they suspected that scientists weren't so curious about them. And um, this is one of the themes we're looking at. I want to kind of discuss whether integrity, um, the topic of UK, the, the work of UKRIO, um, what does integrity demand of university workers, and how does how does integrity depend on communication, on the sharing of um, ideas and conversation within an institution? And actually, um, it's worth possibly mentioning now this word integrity. I don't I don't know I don't know how many of you have kind of looked at it in detail, um, but certainly when you when you think of the word integrity, um, you know the thing which comes to mind is is honesty. The person um, of integrity is honest, can be trusted. Um, integrity is about uh, moral status, um, your ability to look truth in the face, um, and so forth. It's it, it's a, it's a matter of honesty. That's the first definition that comes to mind. But actually, there's a very there's a second very important um, connotation to the word integrity, um, which I want to focus on here. Let, let, let's let's. Let's say that Munkeet has dealt with trust. Um, integrity, the second definition, um, perhaps slightly lower in the kind of university definitions, the second definition is integrity is a matter of being whole, of, of being in balance. Um, but, an, but, a, but, a, but, a, but an institution of integrity um, is in balance. Internally, um, it is communicative. So in other words, integrity is about being whole, about being in balance about um, every part knowing every other part. This sounds abstract. Let me try and um, <clears throat> flesh it out further. Um, but you'll see where I'm heading. I'm trying to get at the idea that <clears throat> communication, whether we call it science communication or arts communication or economics communication, it's as, matter, it's as much a matter of people like me and you, people who work in institutions and universities, as it is um, a matter of what goes on in public. And perhaps one way to um, get further at this issue of, 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 of integrity is to think about the background. Now, James's institution, the UKRIO, the U United Kingdom Research Integrity Office, it was set up in about 2005. Um, there's an American counterpart called the Office of Research Integrity that was set up 14 years earlier in the United States by the Department of Health um, in 1992. And the, um, both the, um, certainly the Office of Research Integrity, and I imagine the UKRIO, was set up because of issues about, not about science communication, 
They were set up because of issues about misconduct and there'd been high profile um, alarms about misconduct, both in the States and in, um, um, and in Great Britain, um, really rumbling on since the 1980s. But they'd become an issue in the 1990s with some high profile cases of dishonesty, of fraud. Um, uh, and the topic misconduct, the word misconduct became uh, much used. Um, a key moment round about the setting up of the UKRI was that a, um, a, um, a scientist, um, a cloning specialist um, called Wu Suk Huang, um, published in Nature his cloning experiments, and every sort of ethical transgression was found to have been um, committed. And it, it, it because of Huang's ambition and his fame and his national status, this became a very big thing in scientific circles. How big a problem do we have about fraud and misconduct? Um, and many other things were going on too. So, for example, um, um, alarmed journal editors like Richard Horton of The Lancet and others set up a thing called the, Commun called the Committee on Publication Ethics. So this was all about how internally within our institution do we make sure that misconduct is rooted out um, and, and, and stopped. And then training courses began for PhD students, for example, in my own institution, um, 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 Imperial College. Um, so that's a kind of warning. I mean, that's part of a problem we have because the, the background to this a great area of interest, um, research integrity, is a kind of in misconduct, is in bad stuff. But of course, you know, as we um, know and as we benefit from, the, the debate has moved on and we talk now very much about research integrity. I think in the second of my definitions, not just trust, but also how we all work together, um, we talk about it in that way. And we talk about the kind of the idea of good science. What, 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 are, our, what are our aspirations as people who work in, in universities? And carrying on in that vein, um, you know, Monkey mentioned surveys of trust. A lot of surveys go on in relation to, you know, what make scientists and humanities researchers, you know, why do they feel, what, what do they enjoy about their work, actually? You know, what, what is important about their work? And, um, you know, all these surveys are fairly kind of um, convincing and, 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 and sort of say the same thing. So I'll mention four things that, that people who value their work in universities, they, they mention four things really as giving them pleasure. So one is autonomy. So the idea that as a person who work in a university, you've got some, um, you've got some sense of control over what you do, that's important. Um, a second thing which academics, researchers, managers, PhD students, they do like discovery. They do like making knowledge. The pleasure of actually producing knowledge is very important to um, academics. And when, when um, Monkey mentions scientists as an honourable and curiosity-driven profession, we see that. Um, a third thing often mentioned, and you'll know this, like, you know, you don't need to do a survey, you'll know this from yourselves. Um, the steady development of your skills is seen as um, an essential part of being somebody who works in research. And finally, and very importantly, and again, no need to do a survey, you can ask yourself this question. A key aspect of what gives us pleasure, um, what might allow us to flourish as people who work in universities, is collegiality. You know, being able to share ideas, information, trusting conversations where you discuss your work without fear of theft or jealousy or anything like, you know, the idea of a, an institution being a place where um, friendly and con convivial um, debate is part of what we do. Now, um, that's almost all I want to say, really, just to mention then that science communication is internal. Um, that's just as important as external. Um, it's about allowing people who work in universities to share ideas, to flourish, um to have autonomy to trust each other you know there's a strong sense in which nothing monkey can do um will undo the damage that is done when a university is um you know a nest of rats you know we have to have a decent working environment for ourselves if we're going to produce sciences that is worth communicating 
Um, now, just to end though, I want I want I want to um, finish really with something my 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 kind of team leader Mary Ryan, who's vice provost of Imperial College, says to me quite often. She says really that research integrity is an ethical issue. Um, that sounds like a very ordinary and normal thing to say. What she's really saying is research integrity is not a management issue solely or a policy issue solely or an HR issue solely. It's an ethical issue. And that makes us wonder, you know, what is it about integrity and communication that is a matter of ethics? And um, perhaps a way to jump ahead here is just to say, when was ethics, was disagreement. Um, almost by definition, ethics is about people not being able to agree on something almost interminably. And that's why you have ethics to kind of debate and keep the talk, talking alive. What is the ethical issue then? What, what is the conflict within universities when it comes to research integrity? In other words, why is this not a matter of you know, good management solely or um, good HR policy? Why is this a kind of matter of fundamental? What, 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 is, what is the issue here? And, and, and I think one way to understand the, the conflict that exists, let me say, within universities as regards integrity um, is a conflict described by, and some of you will know this person, a guy called Alistair McIntyre. He's a moral philosopher. Um, and he points out that um, to an extent, and an extent but certainly worth um, examining, um, and let's put it crudely, um, scientists or academics are in conflict with their wider university environment. And let's, let's say that again, because it's so important, we want to make sure we've got this right. Scientists um, and academics in general are in conflict with the wider university um, environment. It's a, it's a, it's a slightly alarming um, example made by Alistair McIntyre. But I think you'll see where he's coming from. He would say, that the things which allow an academic to flourish, the communicative activities which allow an academic to flourish, autonomy, discovery, steady development of skills, the collegial, they're non-competitive. They're non-competitive. It's not a zero-sum game. If I'm a violinist in, a, um, in an orchestra, if that violinist next to me is excellent, that doesn't mean I can't be excellent. We can all be excellent. We can all be excellent violinists. It's not ranking. It's not prizes. It's not metrics trying to find who's the best. Um, the point about these things like autonomy, discovery, the steady development of skills, the collegiality, the, the point of what we think makes us attain what Munkeet's been talking about, the honourable profession, this is not a zero sum. This is not where you've got, you've got winners and losers. This is not an elite sport. And I think that's very, very, very um, um, persuasive, actually, when we think about humanities scholars and researchers. What is it you're doing? You know, you may be um, deliriously happy about winning a huge grant. You may be extraordinarily excited about getting published in the top journals. But I'm sure that actually... What really gives you pleasure is the daily work of your job, um, the daily uneventful um, aspect of job. For sure, there are accelerative mo moments. It's not also, but it's that which you treasure. Now, the point is, how good are universities at um, nurturing this kind of way, this kind of academic life? When we know that universities are under terrible pressure, they're very anxious about their position in league tables. Um, they use routinely um, um, phrases which begin, we are the most, we are the best, we are the biggest, we are the this, we are the that, as if they are competing with other universities. Um, this, is, this is the problem. Um, this is the issue we have to get right. It doesn't matter what Munkeet does for all his brilliant skills. If we don't produce um, a humanities and a science within our institution, if we don't produce them in an ethical way, um, then it really doesn't, then you're not going to be producing good humanities work. You're not going to be producing good scientific work. Um, so I think that's how I want to end. I'm ending then with a conflict between um, universities under pressure, 
um, universities competing, um, competitiveness being normalized as an academic virtue, was actually um, for, 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 for academics across the world, um, humanities or science, the virtues of science are very much to do with um, quietness, reticence, uh, intimacy of your subject, a degree of innocence when dealing with others. So I think the the, the hopeful issue is that's that's our that's our that's how we move forward. You know, that's how we move forward. We move forward by communicating our work in public, as Munkeet urges, but by seeing ourselves as a communicative profession within our institutions, and trying to help our institutions see excellence. Um, not as a zero sum game, but as a kind of attribute which comes from very ordinary aspects of being an academic. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Stephen, thank you so much for that really enforcing, very powerful talk. And I think that end call for action is something that will resonate. And I can see in the chat it is resonating with an awful lot of the audience. I think what both of you have said is very compelling. You know, science communication doesn't sit on its own. The activities of journalists and scientists aren't isolated. I mean, at UK, I think we define research integrity as all the factors that make research of the highest quality, the highest ethical standards and the highest levels of trust. And that's at the level of the behaviors of individuals or, or teams within the system, the level of organizational systems, policies and cultures, but also then international, international, not only systems for research, but attitudes towards research, what ends it serves, what, how it's produced, the impact it's having, all of this stuff has an impact on public trust in research and trust in researchers. So thank you, Stephen. And Monkey, I'd like you to invite you to rejoin us and we'll now look at questions and discussions. So we've already got some questions in the Q&A, but we'll move on to those. Uh, please do add in more questions as you go. And as a couple of people did raise their hands during the talk, the Zoom's webinar function means your microphones and cameras are muted as attendees. So if you've got any questions or comments, please do click on that Q&A button and pop them in. Okay, so a question that we had in the chat from Dominica was, I think the popularity of social media is proving that science should not only be based on trust, but also on verifiability, so we can validate dissemination of research findings. And I wanted to get your views on the whole sort of verification issue and the reliability and replication. How do you think that has implications for trust and therefore in sort of the improving science communication i think monkey could you go first on that uh yeah i can start i mean i think the the difficulty with verification is then it's like verification by who and what is the criteria for verification so i mean the obvious example here is twitter slash x as it's known now you know there was a system which lots of people complained about for years ever since twitter started doing blue check marks i've nobody how many of you are familiar with that but they have these blue ticks that used to mean that twitter would say oh you are who you say you are particularly if you were a celebrity or an expert or you know a public figure or something like that like the president or something, anything like that and then when elon musk bought twitter and turned it into x he then changed it so that actually a blue check mark didn't mean that at all. It was something you got for paying for a premium service. And then you came with all these benefits like you being able to be seen higher in the comments and sort of things like that. So then immediately, you know, within the space of a few weeks, the entire verification system was thrown out the window. So it can change, you know? And again, I, I bring it back to that point, verified by who? And to different people will have different criteria. We could have, you know, we have regulatory authorities around advertising, around media, around all kinds of different things, certainly around, you know, science. But then lots of people complain about the, the standards that are sort of there. I mean, nobody's ever perfect. Yes, we should always hold those to account and question whether it could be better. But with that in mind, do you accept then that the current, whatever current verification criteria is there means that you are the authority to kind of speak on that? So it's a problematic thing. And again, it's just, it is a very human problem. You know, at the mm -hmm. end of the day, we do tend to just, we want a quick shortcut way of sort of saying, is there a mark there that says, you know, you are funded by the Wellcome Trust or you are blue tick on Twitter or whatever, therefore you're pretty legit. So I'm going to trust what you're kind of saying. Or do we, 
take the time to kind of do the due diligence ourselves of looking through your research papers, looking at your figures, you know, digging through your background, all that kind of stuff. Most of us don't have the time to do that. So we wouldn't kind of do that. We go for the shorthand proxies of what we think, uh, which is where the verification comes in. So, I mean, I wish I had, I wish I had a simple answer or a solution kind of here, but I mean, I think my main point is that it's very, it's very, very complicated. Um, and I mean, the, 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 the short unhelpful answer is that I think the best form of verification is to hold ourselves to account and to the, to whatever extent we can do to, as I say, help the public to uh, be aware. So myself as a journalist or yourselves as researchers, what goes into our jobs, how we check things and how maybe there are some simple checks that you can kind of look at. Like I know not everybody's going to go back and look at all the figures and go through the methodology of whatever paper has just been released, but at least letting people try and understand that that information is out there. And I mean, I think both of us spoke a bit about this, you know, the openness. People put a lot of faith in things like um, open access and transparency of, you know, co declaring conflicts of interest and stuff like that, because they feel that if you're putting it all out there, you are sort of saying, I've got nothing to hide if you want to look through it. That's kind of fine. Although you mentioned Mark Walpert, Stephen, in your talk, and it's quite interesting because Mark said to me when I used to work for him at Welcome, he, he used to say that, you know, that one one counter to this, which a lot of funders or institutions do, is this sort of fire hose of data, which by the okay, we're going to make everything available, and then probably no one's going to look at it because, frankly, who's got the time for this amount of data and the amount of data that comes up things like genomics? I'm, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to I'm going to jump in, Monkey. Um... Yeah, this is a really interesting question. Um, quite a few things. You see, I've been talking about the, um, if you like, the authenticity, the honour of people within universities. Um, so one might say, well, let's let's look at the honour of Munkeet, and as, as a journalist, and he suggests actually that um, you know the best thing might be that the journalists like Munkeet are, are can work properly. That Munkeet has the time um, and, and is encouraged to 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 to, to, to to sift through this information probably but so so journalists become important too as a profession it's worth noting by the way um some of you will know this that the um spring and nature staff in other words the people who publish nature they're on strike they're on strike um that's very important because we need our science journalists to be properly remunerated and to be in a, a good environment you know we can't have good science communication if our journalists are unable to have the time to be honorable but moving from the very profane to the very sublime, um, Monkey will remember his philosophy lessons. He'll remember a, 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 um, a, um, a, phil a philosopher who many of you will know, Sir Karl Popper. And he said, point blank, you cannot verify scientific information. There is no such, as, there is no such thing as scientific truth. You might be moving away from error, but you cannot verify. You cannot, you cannot prove things to be true. So in that world, I think the questioner um, is getting at, which is kind of swirling information, um, you know, information of all sorts. Um, how do you verify it? And I think, I, I think, you know, we all need to be aware that um, there is no such thing as scientific truth. There is no absolute foundational knowledge. There is no um, end point where the truth is attained. Everything is doubtful. Nothing is known for sure. And that makes it even more important that, um, you know, the humility, um, the time taking, um, both of scientists and of journalists, that makes it all the more important because everybody knows that the world is, you know, you don't need to be a scientist to know that things are uncertain. Every, every human being in the world knows that things are uncertain. That isn't a problem. The issue is, um, um, is, is this uncertainty being dealt with in a kind of, um, a, a kind of modest way? So I think that's my, my, my answer to the question. If, uh, I follow Munkeet. Rules won't do it. Rules won't do it. You know, that's for sure. Um, and nor actually will this thing called open science, where everything is accounted and logged um, from cradle till grave. You can have as much information as you want, as, as, as Munkeet says, you know, Mark Walpert, you know, just let all the information out. It won't do it. You, you need, it's a moral capacity. It's the moral capacity to work well that produces um, knowledge you can trust.
Thank you, guys. That was really expansive and really helpful. We've got a question from Sophia about the practicalities of a researcher of communicating. How can we narrow down our audience as researchers? Is it wise, wise pardon me, to write to everyone or is defining a specific audience for your communications more effective? Um, I mean, I can start on, on that one. Um, one thing that I teach my journalism students because it's something that has frankly kind of been a bugbear for me all throughout my career is the fact that I don't think anybody thinks enough about who their audience is when they're communicating. And so it's very easy to then sort of think, I mean, especially in a scientific organized as well, you know, anybody could be interested in this. So I'm, I'm writing for literally everybody, but the, 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 the simple fact of the matter is that you're probably aiming at one person. If you're writing an email, Okay, you might be writing to a group of people, but you're probably anticipating that, you know, they will be particularly invested in it, or there's one or two people that are particularly invested in that. And similarly, when you're right, whether as a journalist, I'm writing an article, I advise students to kind of think about who is your ideal reader, who is the people that you think are going to be reading it. Sure, you know, thousands of other people could read it as well. But more than likely, it's going to be people that are interested in this one particular topic or this one particular aspect. Why would they want to read it? What would they want to get out of it? And so I think if you come back to that basic principle of communication, two points, who is your audience? Who is your, your, your main model audience that you think would get the most out of it? And number two, what clearly in one sentence would be the takeaway point, the action point, the purpose of that? If it's two, can you please fill in the survey? Is it, you know, um, vaccines save lives or sort of something like that? You know, what is it that you want to sort of take away? And if you have that clearly in there, Okay, you might not get huge numbers in terms of the number of citations or views and stuff like that, but the quality, I mean, I think in journalistic terms, in terms of the quality, the number of readers that are really getting something out of that, even if it's not in the millions, if it's more in the thousands, if all of those thousand people read the whole article and take away from that the information that they really understand, like they know that, I don't know, the Queen has died or that, you know, um, the let's say Paxlovid is effective in some instances, but not other others for COVID-19. So they know whether that's a good thing or not, that they should accept it as part of their, um, as part of their COVID treatments. You know, that kind of thing, allowing people to then have a, what I call news you can use, you know, information that's actually going to be practical of practical purpose to somebody, um, even if it's just to make them think of, of kind of a, a different point or consider a different viewpoint or sort of anything like that. But I think if you can think in those terms, you're much more likely to be more effective in your communication. Because it, weirdly, by trying to be more specific, you are much clearer in communication than when you're thinking, well, anybody could be reading this, so I need to, I need to cater to everybody. Mm. So, yeah, I think just narrowing it down. That's really I helpful. Agree. I mean, human key. Sorry, Stephen. Agree, you know, it, it's, it, ha, ha, you know, have someone in mind. You know, um, science communication, which sees itself simply as explanation, you know, descriptions of explanations, it's never enough. You've got to have somebody in mind. It just makes your writing, if that's what you're doing, much livelier. That's great. Thank you. We've now got a question uh, from an anonymous attendee who is a communication professional. As a communications professional, how can I support academics while meeting my institution's priorities around press and social media coverage? What would academics appreciate and help them buy into communications? And they go on to say, I want to support all academics, but there isn't necessarily the public space or resource to share everything. And I'd also like to bring a stronger focus on sharing research internally to encourage collaboration. So it's mm. kind of two questions there what can communication professionals do to be relevant and supportive to academics but also mm. how can we facilitate more communication about research internally within an organization that's a really good question that's very close to my heart yes um i ran a conference last year called the day of doubt and it was about sort of ambiguity and ambivalence within science um and i think one of the things which came from that was you know how can communication professionals within universities um, help academics, you know, not just re report their work. And actually, I think if you can um, sort of facilitate within the institution the idea we don't quite know what the answer is, um, this is taking a bit longer than we thought. If you can introduce, if you, if you can show academics that you understand that it's not just an exciting story, there's doubt, there's ambivalence, there's difficulty, there's slowness, there's failure, there's disappointment. And if you can somehow use your skills as a communicator 
to allow those concepts to move across institutions. I think that's an incredibly important job for people like you to do. We've got a lot of people working in institutions on communications. They're not doing enough to facilitate research in terms of discussion of um, the process and what it's like. And I think that's a that's a real way to move forward. If I was a professional communicator inside a university, I'd be going around interviewing scientists saying, what's hard about this? What's difficult? What's not working? Rather than what's your discovery? You know, what difference is it going to make? I would be looking at the doubt and the disappointment and the ambivalence because these are vital parts of being a scientist. You know, this is this is central to science. And I think we can do more to we can support scientists by showing that these are not sort of hidden um, aspects of being in any laboratory, but are understood by communicative communications specialists, you know, through, through, through the institution. So I think, communi you know, helping scientists communicate their doubts is a really important way to go. And I mean, from my side, I think I would say the best thing you can do is, again, just to kind of support them rather than, as Stephen says, going into the sort of the old way that, that we used to do science press and science communication, which was, you tell me what papers you've got are coming out. I'm going to put out a press release, and we're going to we're going to pump that as a new nature paper or a new science methods paper or kind of whatever like that. That's kind of that's the way that the press sadly has and still largely works, but it's not really the way science is sort of done. Like we say, it's not like you know you put out papers and that's it, solve that problem, cancer has been cured, you know all this kind of stuff like that. It's not it's it's not like that. What is actually more useful? Uh, and again, I'm, I mean, I'm going to go back to the the, the 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 trust issue. Like I kind of say, people trust um, people that they hear from, and I think that the if I could point to media trends, the way that media is changing with the way digital has made an effect and particularly social media, we are now moving from what I'm going to call representational media, which was you would basically trust, I'm going to listen to the Today programme every morning, or I'm going to pick up The Guardian and that's going to be my source, or I'm going to, you know, I'm I'm going to, you know, trust whatever The Times says or sort of anything like that. To now, because largely social media, but also just the web in general, we are now in a presentational phase. Most people, and it's very easy to say young gener younger generations here, but I think it's most generations now, basically trust personalities, influencers, experts, more than necessarily a brand. And it's partly because of, again, the way we get information. People don't tend to remember, I saw that on the BBC, I saw that on the Times. They think, oh yeah, I saw that on Twitter, I saw that on Facebook. Someone emailed me that. They won't necessarily remember that brand. They do remember, Sadly, Alistair Campbell, they remember, you know, Owen Jones, they remember annoying person of Fox News, you know, all this kind of stuff, stuff like that. And we tend to gravitate towards that because we're human beings. We, we, uh, we you know, we respond to people you know, rather than data and, and straight facts, unfortunately. So one thing that I did at the tail end of my time at Welcome was to try and move them on their social media strategy from we're going to pump out loads and loads of organizational messages under them, the brand of welcome, the sort of, you know, big un un black box of welcome kind of thing. Two more, here are the people that work at welcome. Here are the people that welcome funds. These are the people who are experts on that and getting them to be more comfortable with just being seen, speaking in the media, yes, being regularly seen there, but also being comfortable writing, I don't know, a LinkedIn post or a, an X post if you're if you're uh, interested in doing it or another platform or making a YouTube video or a TikTok or sort of anything like this and you know yes I'm going to say younger generations are getting more comfortable with kind of doing that because they're on Instagram all the time they're on TikTok all the time they're on Snapchat all the time and so if you are then willing to just kind of be seen simply talking about the day to day talking about something interesting that's happened in your in your field or that you're kind of know about People get used to sort of seeing scientists just as people and getting to understand the way science works, what Stephen is started talking about. We kind of feel like, you know, we hear from people that are working in shops and in marketing and on, mm. you know, business managers, civil engineers, maybe accountants, lawyers, you know, that kind of stuff like that. You don't often, well, you do more now compared to like, you know, 20 years ago when I started doing science communication. You hear more about it now because you know, the internet and people are being more willing. But again, people still are quite scared to stick their head about the parapet. They don't really know how to use things. They don't know what's ethically or legally right or not. They need a bit of handholding. Confidence 
is a big factor. I definitely see this in my students. It's all about confidence. It's not that they can't do it. It's not that they're not experts on the things that they know about, but actually they just need a bit of confidence. So I think actually just supporting them in what they can do, helping them to shop ideas, you know, make summarize things down from, you know, this huge 20,000 word pre written in passive voice into like a short one sentence or three bullet point thing that someone would understand. Encouraging them when you see opportunities to just go and give a talk, even to a local school or sort of something like that. Or when something interesting happens, like I say, write a LinkedIn post, go on TikTok or whatever it is that you're kind of comfortable with. Anything like that, the more that happens, the more that people kind of do that, the more people will just see science and scientists as being part of the kind of normality. And I know this runs counter to the sort of ivory tower honorable profession thing, the way we've kind of talked about. But I mean, when I was at Imperial, you know, as a student under Stephen and others, that's one of the most useful things that we would kind of take away. The fact that, you know, the more people we saw in those graphs, people trust people like me. If they trust scientists and people that are doing things, they can see how they're kind of doing it. I think that will actually help counter to the fact that, you know, we, you know, we don't know what they're doing, but they seem to be quite trustworthy. I trust kind of that. I think actually that trust will go up even more and they'll be more confident and they'll get better information if they are just seeing people able to talk to them on a regular basis. And I think we saw that 45% mark. We don't think scientists are interested in hearing from us. I'd be very interested if then that goes up because actually they do see that scientists are normal people that they can talk to. And if I ask you, what do you think of this new COVID vaccine, for example, and you are able to talk about it, or even if you're not, you say, I'm sorry, I'm actually a mathematician. I can't comment on that or whatever. Then I think that's fair enough. You can kind of understand that. But otherwise, you know, people aren't going to know that. They're just going to see black box scientists in the same way that, you know, I write for the BMJ. Black box doctor, can you tell me about my cancer? No, sorry, I'm an eye doctor. You know, that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that the more you can just support people, the, the, the better. Mm. That's really helpful. I think a message not just for the communications professionals in the audience, but also the senior researchers, the PhD supervisors, the managers and heads of schools and departments. And I think this is something that needs to be taught and supported in researchers from, you know, possibly even at the undergraduate level. This is something that can take time to sort of drill into people. Someone who suddenly became the face of UK Aware webinars in May 2020 because we decided to do webinars because of the pandemic. It was a daunting thing to do, but very rewarding. And also, Monkey, thank you, because I was about to ask a question from Michael about trust that he placed very patiently in the chat a while ago. I think you've answered that as well. I think we've got time for one quick questions and quick answers. We don't have about five minutes left, but the conversations and your insights from both of you have been fascinating. And thank you so much for those. Nicole asked, would it be perhaps some kind of declaration at the end of a paper or a piece of science communication that, you know, some community, and you, if you have some sort of community agreed standards of science communication and there's sort of self-declaration at the end of every communication that this has been produced in line with those standards, would that be helpful? Obviously, there's, you know, there's the sense that you're asking people to sort of mark their own homework, but it does perhaps, if there were some community standards out there that were commonly accepted and applicable to a wide range of research communications, that would at least get people thinking about this stuff and checklists can be very useful to remind people to do things which they might otherwise miss or perhaps be tempted to cut corners on a bit. What do you think of that idea? Uh, Stephen, perhaps you could go first. Yes, I think I think it's good. I mean, anything which gets, um, you know, research professionals discussing, you know, how to validate their work and, and anything which gets colleagues talking about what makes our work um, worth taking seriously, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good idea. Thank you, Monkey. Did you have any thoughts on that? Um, so, I mean, I, I, I'm a bit in, in two minds about it. On the one hand, I agree with Stephen. I think anything that gets people to think about it is probably a good thing. I mean, the sceptical part of me is that, unfortunately, those kind of things become like a bit of a tick box or furniture in and around where it's just kind of there. We all tick it like, like we do with terms and agreements for anything on the web these days. Yeah, I've done it without really engaging with it so after a time how do you ensure that people actually do that and i guess that would come down to some sort of regulation some kind of checking in of that kind of thing who's going to do that particularly who's going to fund that you know i think is is quite key so i mean i guess there's no harm in doing it especially if it doesn't cost very much but on the other hand i, I can I, i'm not really sure in the long term it will actually enforce anything Thank you both so much. We've got a few minutes before we close the webinar at 11. So for each of you, I'd like to say if there's one sort of 
and I know it's, it's such a broad topic, so I'm setting you a challenge. If there's one sort of take home message that you'd like to reiterate to our audience, what would it be? Uh, if we go in the order of the speaker, so monkeys, if you could go first, please. What one message about science communication or about research communication in general, even? Um, well, I mean, I, th I, I guess in, I'd go back to my communication in general thing. I definitely do think that if you think in terms of like, um, who am I communicating, who is this for, and what's the purpose of it, it makes your communication clearer. Um, and it can probably also just help you focus in terms of like what you're doing and why you're doing it, um, which I think will strengthen, as I say, the general integrity of what you're doing. I mean, at the end of the day, unfortunately, we're all human beings. We all have different standards of what we would call integrity. Um, some people might think it's okay to do one thing, another person might not, and we might hope that most of us have the same sort of broad values and benchmarks, but I'm not sure if that's necessarily the kind of case. So all we can hope is that, as I say, we, we're, we're clear in, in what we're doing. And if, and this isn't a very clear answer, but if you if you see someone that's doing something, something wrong, call them out on it. That's really helpful. Thank you. And Stephen, what's your sort of a key message for so, today? So opinion? yeah, two, two, two very quick ones. One, um, see communication as absolutely integral with research, um, whether it's outside the institution or inside, that's the first thing. And second, I think everything we've discussed today reminds us of the importance of universities, of the importance of research, the importance of academics finding things out. Um, I mean, I've said it's all mixed into the communication, but I'm not, I, 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 but the, the idea of research is fundamental. We know that universities, certainly in the United Kingdom, are under pressure. We need to defend universities. Um, you know, they're trusted. We know from a recent survey, tr universities are trusted. We need, to we need to do everything we can to support university work. Thank you both so much. That was a very informative, insightful, and very powerful presentation from both of you. I think, and also a useful reminder, need reassurance that research is part of a greater whole. Yes, there's this kind of higher hour tower aspects of it. I mean, research is still often seen as the lone genius idea when it's actually collaborative and so collegiate. But the fact that this stuff does matter to people, that how researchers conduct themselves matters to people because it reinforces or perhaps even degrades the trust that the public has in research. And the fact that also research communication is part of a wider ecosystem, both within institutions that communication, especially who ask their question earlier, but also research and science journalists such as yourself, Monkeith, and the role that they play. So I'd like to thank Stephen and Monkeith so much for coming along today, especially Monkeith, who kindly kept in at short notice when another speaker unfortunately had to take and leave absence from the webinar. So thank you both so much. Your presentation is really insightful. And thank you, the audience. The questions have been amazing. And I'm so sorry I haven't been able to answer more of them, but we'll see what we can do to follow up on this important issue. And we'll be circulating recordings and slides and even say speakers' notes from the event shortly. UK Rio will be announcing its webinar programme for the 24-25 academic year shortly, so please keep an eye on our event bright. And uh, there's been a link to the chat as well as post the event survey and links to our existing banks of webinar recordings. So thank you all so much.